From Chicago studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samana Siddiqui. Our top story tonight is about the approval of the budget plan by the Senate. U.S. lawmakers have approved Democrats' budget resolution. They voted on party lines with a 50 to 49 vote hours after passing a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. This will allow Democrats to fund climate change programs. It would also expand Medicaid to include dental and eye care. In addition, it will provide free preschool and community college. However, this is a blueprint and not an actual law yet. House leaders announced their chamber will vote on it in two weeks. Final congressional approval is protected from a Republican filibuster in the 50-50 Senate based on Senate rules. This is subject to moderate Democrats agreeing with others on such a massive price tag of $3.5 trillion for the programs. U.S. President Joe Biden urged Afghanistan's leaders Tuesday to unite and fight for their nation against Taliban insurgents. President Biden said the U.S. would continue to support the government in the Afghan capital, Kabul. He added that he did not regret his decision to pull U.S. troops out by August 31st, after two decades of war. Afghan leaders have to come together. We lost thousands, lost death and injury, thousands of American personnel. They've got to fight for themselves, fight for their nation. Meanwhile, the Taliban seized three more Afghan provincial capitals on Tuesday. This includes one just 125 miles from Kabul. That marks the capture of the ninth Afghan provincial capital in five days. Tens of thousands of people fled their homes in the north for the relative safety of Kabul and other centers. In this image, Taliban fighters are patrolling the streets of the northern city of Kunduz on Monday. It is one of six provincial capitals captured by the Taliban following a weekend blitz across the north of the country. A European Union official said the fighters now control 65% of the country. U.S. Special Envoy Zalmay Khalilzad is now in Qatar to try and convince the Taliban to accept a ceasefire. Envoys from hosts Qatar, China, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Britain, the United Nations, and the European Union were also due to discuss the situation in Afghanistan, a source told AFP. In the meantime, Russia rounded off joint military exercises in Tajikistan with war games on Tuesday. Earlier that day, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said America is evaluating the threat environment around its embassy in Kabul on a daily basis. As COVID's highly contagious Delta variant continues to spread, many hospitals are reporting record numbers of children being hospitalized. This is especially true in areas with low vaccination rates, including Arkansas, Florida, Missouri, and Texas. Dr. Christina Probst is a pediatrician in Houston. She told Democracy Now! that children under 12 are currently America's most vulnerable population. They are also still ineligible for the COVID-19 vaccines. Probst also says Texas Governor Greg Abbott's order banning mask mandates in schools is a purely political decision that ignores science. She said Abbott's order is a direct threat to the health and well-being of Texas's children. In Florida, the Broward County School Board voted Tuesday to maintain the school district's mask mandate. This is in defiance of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's order to do the opposite. The board voted 8 to 1 to keep the mask mandate in place. Broward County Schools began the academic year on Tuesday. A U.S. Tenth Circuit court has revived a case filed by a former Muslim inmate in Colorado against Sergeant Thomas Currington. Tajuddin al-Shahid was forced to shave off his beard after Currington threatened him with confinement if he did not do so. Currington was his guard while he was incarcerated. Al-Shahid claims that his free exercise of religion and equal protection rights were violated because of his guard's animus toward Muslims. The Institute of Justice, the Cato Institute, and Muslim advocates filed amicus briefs on behalf of al-Shahid. Al-Shahid said he has practiced Islam for decades and follows the practice of Prophet Muhammad of leaving one's beard to grow. Reviving the case, the court observed that the guard engaged 
in intentional religious discrimination with anti-Muslim animus. Ashahid's case was earlier dismissed by the district court. This was partially based on a qualified immunity claim by Sergeant Currington. A Manassas, Virginia area mosque is calling on the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to release decorative tiles that were bound for its new building. The tiles have been held since late June at Dulles International Airport. On Tuesday, leaders from Manassas Mosque and Northern Virginia's Islamic community said U.S. Customs and Border Protection is threatening to destroy nearly 750 pounds of tiles. They feature verses from the Quran. The U.S. is not releasing the tiles simply because they came from Iran. That is where U.S. sanctions have targeted the government's nuclear program. But the tiles are a gift from another mosque in the city of Qom, the faith leaders say. They stress that they have nothing to do with the Iranian government. Customs and Border Protection agents say the mosque can either have the tiles returned to Iran or destroyed. In international news today, Wildfires have killed at least 42 people in Algeria, authorities said on Tuesday. They were caused by blistering temperatures and tinder dry conditions. The death toll included 25 soldiers who were killed as they successfully rescued more than 100 women and children. Algeria joins a string of countries to be hit by major blazes in recent weeks. These include Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Russia, and the Western United States. More than 70 fires have broken out in 18 states across the north of Algeria. Meteorologists predicted the temperature would hit 115 degrees Fahrenheit this week. This is while the North African country also struggles with severe water shortages. On Monday, the UN released a major report showing how global warming is even more dangerous than previously thought. It highlighted how scientists are quantifying the extent to which global warming caused by human beings increases the intensity or likelihood of extreme weather. This includes heat waves and wildfires. In India, at least six people are in police custody for calling for a massacre of Indian Muslims in the country's capital, New Delhi. They include a former spokesman of India's governing right-wing Bharatiya Janta Party, or BJP. The rally was organized on Sunday by Ashwini Upadhyay, a BJP leader who is also a Supreme Court lawyer. Delhi police did not move to arrest the culprits until public pressure forced them to do so. This was despite the fact that they knew who the leaders of the rally were. Participants called for scrapping India's colonial era laws that allow certain rights to religious minorities in India. The event was also used for calling for a massacre of Muslims in the country. Calling Muslims pigs, demonstrators called for the mass slaying of Muslims. Muslims make up about 14% of India's population of more than 1 billion. Other slogans threaten Muslims by saying, if you want to live in Hindu land, you will hail Lord Ram. Ram is one of the most revered deities in Hinduism. A BJP-led movement led to demolishing the 500-year-old Babri Masjid in 1992. Hindu extremists claim the house of worship was built on Ram's birthplace. Last year, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi laid the foundation stone of a temple being built there. Scottish Health Secretary Hamza Youssef has launched legal proceedings against a nursery near the city of Dundee. He says the little scholar's nursery discriminated against his two-year-old daughter. This was by admitting children with Western-sounding names over her. Youssef and his wife Nadia al-Nakhla have given little scholars two weeks to provide settlement proposals. They are asking for a public apology and donation to an anti-racist charity of their choosing. If this does not happen, they said they will raise action at Dundee Sheriff Court. Little Scholars denies discriminating against the child and said it is extremely proud of its admissions policy. The Council of Islamic Ideology Pakistan has condemned a mob attack and desecration of a temple of the Hindu community in Bang Sharif in the province of Punjab. In a statement on Monday, the council said, like the lives and property of non-Muslim minorities living in Pakistan, the protection of their places of worship is the legal responsibility of the state. The council said no individual or group can be allowed to damage and harass non-Muslim communities in the country. The statement said demolishing any of their religious places of worship 
is a clear violation of Islamic law and Pakistani law. It asks that all perpetrators of the crime be prosecuted in accordance with law. The Council welcomed the government's decision to rebuild the demolished temple. South Korea reported over 2,200 coronavirus cases on Wednesday. That is the highest daily count since the pandemic hit the country in January last year. South Korea has seen a rise in new infections since July 7th. That was when COVID's Delta variant was first reported in the nation. The government has already imposed tight COVID restrictions in the capital, Seoul, which is the epicenter of the latest outbreak. It has banned gatherings of more than two people after 6 p.m. It has also placed a curfew on restaurants and cafes after 10 p.m., according to Yonhap News Agency. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes Walk a mile in my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk a mile in my shoes Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Welcome back. In one of our in-depth analysis segments, we discussed a report by the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, highlighting incidents of Islamophobia in North America until now. Let's watch. Thank you very much once again. Today, we're happy to be joined by Robert McCaw, who is Director of Government Affairs at the Council of American Islamic Relations. Robert, thank you so much for your valuable time with us today. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam and our pleasure. Now, recently, of course, the Council of American Islamic Relations, or CARE, released a mid-year report covering anti-bias um, incidents towards Muslim Americans or Muslims in North America in general. How are the findings in this report any different from the previous one that was released? Well, what we found in, to go back, our previous report was actually for 2020, looking back at 2019, we had over 6,000 reports of anti-Muslim bias incidences uh, spanning anywhere from discrimination while traveling at the U.S. border through airports, job discrimination, anti-school bullying, or just on the street harassment or violence. Uh, this mid-year report is something that CARE traditionally does not do, but we saw a very large uptick in anti-Muslim bias incidents, uh, acts of violence targeting both Muslims and houses of worship, that we thought it was really important to capture this moment in a mid-year report. It's a short spotlight report, it's 10 pages, but it highlights the fact that CARE in just 2021 has so far received 500 reports to our national office. Uh, and that's not including the reports that we're going to be getting from our chapters at the end of the year when we traditionally do our report. But we also then focused on what we found were 38 really significant cases of anti-mosque violence, uh, anti-Muslim intimidation, uh, anti-Muslim hate speech, and acts of violence targeting Muslims in the U.S. We also did a special spotlight that looked at the cases and the uptick of anti-Muslim violence in Canada, which is just north to us. It's on our border. It's where a lot of American Muslims go. And we were just concerned in seeing this uptick that really followed the conflict uh, where Israel bombarded Gaza two months ago. So following that in May and June, we saw this uptick both in the United States and Canada. We sadly saw that terrorist attack that took place in London, Canada, that targeted three generations of a Muslim family, killing four individuals, injuring a, a son that was later released. And so we wanna capture this moment because uh, when you see such a spike in anti-Muslim hate, 
You want to collect it all in one place. We saw very much in the media that individual cases were, were being reported on, but we never saw that this trend itself was being spoken to. Thank you so much for that insight. Uh, you mentioned to this a little bit, but let's get into it. The, interestingly, the report highlights how Islamophobia in America uh, somewhat coincides with the recent Israeli assault in parts of Palestine. If you could talk to us about this link and why that was highlighted in the report. I, it was highlighted in the report because we actually saw this uptick in anti-Muslim violence as being associated with or inspired by the conflict that took place where Israel was bombarding certain parts of Gaza or, you know, trampling the religious freedoms of worshipers at al Asqa Mosque or confiscating land. Uh, we saw the, the conflict overseas translate into hostility towards Muslims in the U.S. Now, some of these attacks actually reference the conflict. Others were just general acts of hostility that occurred either during or after this conflict in May and June. And so, uh, you know, when you see such an international incident take place and then an immediate uptick of violence against Muslims, just as we saw an uptick of violence against uh, members of the Jewish community being targeted by white supremacists and other groups, you know, this is something that we want to document uh, and be a part of this story uh, just because we didn't believe the media was doing a good job in covering this. Now, there were approximately five key areas that you also alluded to in the anti-Muslim bias incidents mentioned in the report. If you could perhaps briefly tell us about the violent versus non-violent bias incidents and the implications that your organization is trying to challenge right now. Yeah, so we did really break it down into five different areas. We had anti-mosque incidents, and that included acts of hate crimes where mosques were being vandalized, broken into. Uh, in one case, a worshiper was attempted, there was attempted stabbing of a worshiper at the Darl Hidra Mosque in Northern Virginia. And so these were cases that we were focusing in on. There was also uh, what I would say is a threatening incident that was targeting a, a Palestinian community center, which was being targeted with uh, anti-Muslim hate speech and bomb threats. Uh, and again, that was during uh, the uh, conflict where Israel was bombarding uh, Gaza and other places. Uh, so what we saw was that there are anti-mosque incidents, there are acts of school bullying. While we documented one physical assault in a school, most of school bullying is actually just verbal threats, harassment, or intimidation. We also have illegal discrimination. So we see, you know, either customers being discriminated against because they're Muslim, or especially quite often Muslim passengers on planes. Uh, being intimidated by other passengers or by the actual hostesses on the planes. Uh, and then we see acts of hate speech where it's, you know, uh, either verbal or written harassment expressing anti-Muslim prejudice, but it doesn't necessarily intimate violence. Um, while during many hate crimes that we documented, that would be associated with hate speech during the crime. So you can see the difference that we'd want to split up hate crimes versus just hate speech. And just out of all these different categories, Islamophobia was the main uh, motivating factor. So this is why it was a report of anti-Muslim bias incidents. And then we broke that down between either being violent or uh, you know, non-violent. Let's talk a little bit about the recommendation section. Inter interestingly, in the report's recommendations, there is mention of Islamophobia against Muslim minorities on a global scale. Have anti-Muslim policies in countries such as India and France, France, which is what the report mentions, perhaps led to the increase of racism here in North America? You know, I, I really think it's, a, it's an exchange of horrible ideas. And so what we've tracked in India is that it's, um, its government, you know, the BJP uh, political party running the government in association with the RSS, that they are actually using anti-Muslim conspiracy theories that are being exported by the U.S. by anti-Muslim hate groups, and they're watering them down to fit local narratives. So really, there's an exchange of hateful ideas coming from the U.S. going into India. We then also see 
um, <clears throat> anti-Muslim, uh, you know, periodicals, pieces uh, by pro-Hindu Vista groups in the U.S. that is taking this language. So really, it is an exchange of really bad ideas that is inciting violence, but it really goes beyond just India. We see China in their policies of repression, torture, genocide, targeting the Uyghurs, that they're using the U.S.'s war on terror narratives, and they're using really talking points that the U.S. itself has given up because I, I think our own officials had realized the, you know, the damage and the bias that was being caused by earlier U.S. narratives, but China just keeps it going. We also see in France right now the government using, you know, the ideas of, you know, cultural war or, you know, a war of ideas and then into introducing anti-Muslim policies that are, you know, either dismissing imams, shutting down Islamic NGOs, targeting Muslim private schools. Uh, so it really, it, it's, it's a range of ideas uh, that have an anti-Muslim bias in them that target Muslims and they're being expressed in different ways in these different countries. But I really do think there's an interconnectedness between anti-Muslim hate, whether you see it in China, in Burma, in India, France, uh, or, you know, how it plays out in places like Israel or Kashmir. Uh, a lot of the similar talking points that Muslims are facing in the U.S. or Europe are being exported into other countries looking for good excuses to target Muslims. And I might add, and this is really important, CARE's uh, mid-year hate crime report coincided with a call from Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and Jan Schakowsky, uh, joined by 20 other members of Congress, in calling for the State Department to establish a special envoy for monitoring and combating Islamophobia, because the United States really does rec need to recognize that uh, Islamophobia is a global th th phenomenon. It's a global threat. Uh, it affects the safety of not only Muslims overseas, but in the U.S. and when Muslims in the U.S. travel overseas. And so we are really pushing the United States to adopt a definition of Islamophobia, to create a State Department office to track uh, Islamophobia overseas and offer recommendations and how to curb this uh, hate, which is becoming uh, either violent or repressive in the form of other state policies. How hopeful are you that any of the additional recommendations concerning, for example, the special envoy that you propose, as well as a change or an increase in uh, anti-hate legislation, will perhaps reverse these biased trends facing Muslims? And if you could talk to us a little bit about those two recommendations in terms of change from a federal level. Yeah, you know, I, I think the first easiest step is for when an anti-Muslim bias incident on a large scale occurs, like the one in Canada, or, you know, domestically, that President Biden uses his podium, members of Congress, that they, they denounce these types of acts of violence. Uh, we didn't see the administration actually comment on that terrorist attack targeting the family in London, Canada. And, you know, we were disappointed as a community by that. But that can easily be addressed just by the government and government officials standing up to condemn these types of violence that are targeting Muslims and to denormalize it from the last administration. Now, when we're looking at the, creating a special envoy position, uh, you know, in January, the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations called on the Biden administration uh, to create such a position. CARE members of USCMO have been asking for such a position for years. Uh, we had a dialogue last week in the Muslim community about, you know, who has been pushing who on this issue for how long, because we have all been working on this. And it, it's really great to understand how this has been a very large intra-community um, push. But I was excited because Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, Jen Schakowsky, who's a Jewish member of Congress, we had the three Muslim representatives, Omar, uh, Tlaib, Carson, Join seven Jewish members of Congress, Schakowsky, Steve Cohen, Sarah Jacobs, uh, Alan Lowenthal, Mike Levin, Brad Schneiders, and Dan, Dean Phillips, uh, with other members of Congress and asking for this. So this isn't just like a small ask by the Muslim delegation. This is really an intra-faith. Uh, this is a very progressive ask. 
Uh, and I, I think that we can build momentum behind this. We also have reports from Congresswoman Omar that she's going to be introducing legislation on this matter. You know, on that letter to the Biden administration calling for the special envoy position, there were several members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee on that letter. I believe that will translate to co-sponsorship uh, of this legislation by members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we are looking to have that introduced and hopefully attached to larger spending bills in that committee um, or appropriations committees with their support. So I think that this is a real possibility in the next year to two years that we could either by legislation mandate a permanent position or we could compel the Biden administration to create such an envoy position. And I know for a fact that, you know, when Biden runs for office again uh, in, you know, 2024, he's going to be courting the Muslim community. And the Muslim ban was good, you know, repealing it, but that was just a day one initiative. And he's going to have to show that he's done more for the community. And I guarantee you, if he created this position, it would be a strong signal to the Muslim community. So I just think, you know, politically, strategically, it is in the interest of the Biden administration to, you know, create such a position. Now, as a disclaimer, CARE doesn't support any candidate for office. But, you know, I'm just postulating hypothetically what the Biden administration could do to better win our votes. So I, I think there's a good political argument to be made for this. I think there's a good legal argument for this to be made. I think it's a real possibility in the next year, two years we could see this happen. Discussing anti-discrimination and anti-racism efforts today with Robert McCaw, who is Director of Government Affairs at the Council on American Islamic Relations. Robert, in light of the recent report that was released by CARE, thank you so much for your valuable time with us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Before moving on to our next analysis, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back after these messages. our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. Welcome back. We covered the news of the recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and also discussed its findings in our previous shows. Tonight, one of the authors of the IPCC report is joining Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid for an exclusive interview. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Samana. The world is talking about IPCC sixth assessment report. It has been issued and we are honored to have one of its key author, lead author, a Professor Piers Forster. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. It is fantastic to be with you guys here today. It's really good to be on the show and be able to talk about this exciting report we're delivering to the world. Professor Forster is a professor of physical climate change 
and director of the Priestley International Center for Climate at the University of Leeds, UK, where he's joining us from. And as I mentioned, he was the coordinator and lead author of the recent report. Uh, I hope uh, the process was as exciting for you as tiring. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, well, the first thing to say is that this is the first major update of the science on climate change since the last assessment way back in 2013. So in fact, this report reports on eight years of work by the climate science community, and that community has become huge. There are scientists working now in virtually every country reporting on their changes. So, so that really meant we have we had to we had to try and go through all of their excellent publications. So this took a two and a half years of work to try and sift through these publications and to try and put them all together to really try and make sense of what is going on. So it's a big undertaking, really. So. Uh, professor, since the, uh, it took eight years in the making, uh, how do you ensure that the data is more recent? Because it takes time to publish a scientific paper or peer review and all that. How your data is, uh, you know, to the level that it is current? Yeah, well, in fact, that's, so you, did, you did bring up a very interesting kind of point in that. And I've done a lot of interviews, but you're the first person to ask me that and it's really interesting because in fact what we tend to do in the report is we don't just rely entirely on the publications we sometimes just take the te the techniques that are reported in the publications and we then try and apply those techniques to the latest satellite data or the latest observations or even these brand new computer simulations that are coming out of the world's climate modeling centers. Yeah, so in fact, we put all the different lines of evidence together to try and make our overall assessment of how things have changed. I have read uh, in the reports about it that um, uh, the government leaders, politicians, uh, in the last two weeks of the finalization, were able to dwell on the findings or summary or the recommendations. Could you share with us the confidence that scientists have the final say on these matters, not the politicians? Yes, well, I'm quite happy to talk about this because in fact, this is something that gets asked about the way the IPCC works quite often, and it's important to understand where the acronym comes from. The IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental kind of Panel, and what that is is a kind of panel of a, the 195 world countries, and it is that kind of panel that can in the report and it is the same kind of panel that does have to sign off on the summary so what that we have to do we have to agree the summary unanimously with all the different countries and you incredible what you do really you do go through a track chain word document all together so it's quite ridiculous and you can spend four hours just discussing one particular word or something like that. So, 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 so you go through this process, uh, 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 and a lot of people are concerned about the political influence of a particular country. But in 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 in, in fact, I don't think it works too badly at all because this is the fifth or sixth report I have done. Uh, uh, and there are 
a few countries that want to push the report in a particular direction, but there are also plenty of other countries that really want to defend the science. So, so in so from my experience, the report really hasn't been diluted, and in fact, the opposite has occurred, and the report comes across in a language that the policymakers stand. Um, and just just one more thing, if I may say, that, that in, I think because the governments buy into it, that does that does mean then that they understand the report and they take it on board for the climate negotiations. So I think because of that whole process of doing it together, the governments are far more interested than they would be in just the typical report that lands on their desks. Professor Forster, share with us, among the smaller nations, in terms of size and the stage of development, who are more enthusiastic participants? Well, that is really interesting because I have been involved in these reports now since 2001, and that has completely changed. So when I did when I did first begin, it was really only the developed countries that took a keen interest. So my own country, Germany, United States and perhaps a bit of interest from China and thing like this. But, but there, was, there, there wasn't a lot of interest from the rest of the world, but that has totally changed. So, so in, in, in fact, in these negotiations, the whole situation is almost reversed entirely, where some of the most vulnerable countries are do talk more than any of the other ones. So these are the tiny islands in the Caribbean, for example, island like St. Kitts is one of them. Yeah, they do play a huge role in the, the, the negotiations uh, and countries like the kind of Philippines and in India as well do really have very significant parts. So I think that has really changed now and practically every country has something to say now. Well, Professor Foster, if you don't mind, um, share with us some of the major recommendations. Well, the, yeah, so that's something we're clear on in the report. We don't try, we don't try and make policy recommendations. That, ups, that is up to the different countries and their politicians to decide what to do. But so, so we just tell the world what is occurring and what the options are. But in just in terms of that, what we do tell the world is that, is that if we can reduce our emissions by between 40 and 50% in the next 10 years and then get to these net zero targets. This is zero emissions of greenhouse gases by the middle of the century. We then have a chance to keep temperatures to within one and a half degrees centigrade. I can't convert that to Fahrenheit, I apologize. I, apologize. I probably could if I thought about it, but. But yeah, so one and a half degree centigrade above where we were in the 1800s. Mm. Uh, tell us, is media properly amplifying your findings or it is it still busy in this is scandal or the other? Well, I, yeah, I think, I think like all things, if there's something going on like, like fires or some, kind of clever devastation of some kind, then there's a lot of interest, of course. And if we've seen these terrible clever events occurring more and more often, and that is something we say in the report, that we have good evidence they're getting worse, and we have good evidence they're caused by our activities. But, but I think also then, once the fires have died down, the, then perhaps it gets, then the changes get too quickly forgotten. 
but so, so somehow we have to try and keep everyone talking about it and to keep it on people's agenda, really. Uh, share with us, you being in the uh, <clears throat> UK, uh, Europe has a lot of, I mean, wildfires are really going wild and the floods are becoming mm -hmm. historic. Um, when the reports were coming, extraordinary dramatic reports, uh, video reports and all that, not many people spoke up that it is connected. Is it really connected with the climate change? Well, it, it, uh, yeah, that is, yes. So, so that is some brand new science in the report that wasn't there when we did the last assessment. Uh, 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 and there's this whole kind of science that have been developed. And that is, that is about really trying to connect these extreme changes we're experiencing to our emissions of greenhouse gases and what it involves is complex analysis and complex simulations to try and see what the weather would have been like if we didn't have our emissions uh, uh, and in fact this evidence is quite categoric the, not just in European countries, in fact, all over the world. We see in California and in Canada this year earlier. We see it in Pakistan and India and all over, all over the world. Were all places, you know, Siberia, people yeah. think of... They had huge high temperatures, you're absolutely right. And they had temperatures outside of anything they had ever experienced. Uh, uh, and, and we can categorically say that a good deal of that is from our missions that have really, really changed the world to experience whether we can have ever experienced. Mm. Uh, Professor Forster, should people start thinking of living away from wooded area and the seashores? Um, I think you make a really good point about the way we have to adapt. Um, yes, we have to try and adapt our society to try and cope with the higher temperatures because they're, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, and in terms of that sort of thing you can do, yes, you can build your kind of houses to be more prepared for the wildfires. So you can good good guttering, planting them away from woods and things. And uh, yes, and also worried about sea level, you can try and make sure you have good protection. But 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 ultimately, what we have to do as a society is to really reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases as fast as possible. But Professor Forster, you and other scientists have been saying this now for a while. You're right. And the government seems to be slow to move. While my children, my grandchildren, they are raised on being thoughtful, recycling and conservation and all that. Why, why scientists are unable to provide more tool to lay people who are listening to you more than the slow moving governments? Well, yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, so of, of course, governments aren't going as fast as we need them to, but we're also asking big transformational changes to our society to kind of drive different electric cars, to heat and cool their homes differently, to perhaps use public transport a bit more and to do all the recycling or the other things. So there are big changes we're asking, but what I would what I would say, and I think you raised an interesting point there, Malay, about the brand new generation that are far better than we are. So, so, so there are so many opportunities there with new exciting jobs. Uh, and I think if we can transform our society, our society will be a lot more sustainable and happier. So, so, so I just think there are huge opportunities. So 
I think if I was 15 or 16 now, beginning my careers, I sort of want to get into these brand new industries. Professor Foster, give us some hope. I um, mean, you have spent quite a bit of your life working on this. I have. You know ups and downs. You know the science and you know the politics. Give us some hope for the future. Well, yeah, so I have somehow, I think I do, I think I have still retained some optimism that things have changed and things are changing, perhaps not quite at the pace we wanted to, and perhaps we can't keep temperatures below one and a half degrees, but there is certainly some optimism in the report the, the, that we have a much better idea now that if we if we if we can get on top of our greenhouse gas emissions we can actually can support temperature rise and we can prevent the extreme getting worse so and governments have how can it change and things have changed so you we can see kind of wind wind turbines everywhere now we can see solar pv everywhere a lot of people are driving from the teslas and and there's something people are talking talking about so perhaps things aren't changing as fast as we want them to but things are definitely changing well thank you so much uh, professor Foster, for your time uh, we truly really appreciate that and it's fantastic to be able to talk to you and i do wish you all the best Back to you, Samana. Professor Foster is among the lead authors of IPCC's sixth assessment report. It has been a pleasure talking to him. Thank you so much, Imam Mujahid. That's all from our Chicago studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Salam and good night.